Hi, my name is Jan Glazner, and it is my privilege this morning to introduce to you Peggy Glazner. She is um, my mother-in-law, so happy Mother's Day a little early. <laughs> but um, we're, we're going to be talking a little bit about what it's like for her to have been a mom and some of, some of her experiences. And one of the best perks, I think, of being her daughter-in-law is just the support and the wisdom and the friendship that we've had and shared over the years. And so um, we have a special relationship. And I don't think that Peggy, Nana, you ever dreamed that at 97 you would be sitting here on camera getting asked questions about motherhood back when you were in the middle of everything but um, you've been here at Family Church for about 10 years and Peggy has done um, women's Bible studies. She has shared um, her life in that way. She and Jim were in a small group, and so they have participated in the life of the body that way. But I think the most important contribution that she's made at Family Church here is probably the raising of her son back in the years and the days when it was probably a thankless task on most days and weeks. And so we appreciate that very much, and we're going to ask you a few questions. But first of all, uh, we'd like to know, Peggy, what was it like for you? Um, what was your salvation experience when you became alive to Christ and, and Jesus became real to you? I don't remember any time when I didn't go to church. And I was baptized as a baby, and when I was 12, they had a class, and they asked us if we believed in Jesus, and we all said yes, and so then we were Christians. And... Uh, we I always went to Sunday school, always went to church, enjoyed it, liked it, was interested in Bible stories. <clears throat> and then we moved when I was 15 to, uh, to Omaha, where it was the high school was big. And uh, I was kind of lost and homesick, and so I made my new friends at the church. And this church, they talked about being saved and being born again. And, and uh, I believed that I, I believed everything I'd been taught. So I didn't, I, I just figured it was okay. And then we had a youth group where they had some, a team from Moody Bible Institute were giving lessons, uh, flannel graph lessons, the first ones that we'd ever seen. That was new then. <laughs> Tell that how, how long ago that was. <laughs> and they, they, sh they put a door up. They were telling the story of Moses and the deliverance from Egypt. And they had a door up about the Passover. And they said, now God said to kill a lamb and put the door, put, put the blood on the door. And so if they said if, if somebody just tied a live lamb outside the door, that would be like in our time, like somebody that believed in Jesus, that was he was a good man, he was a good teacher, but not that he was God the Son. And I was kind of, you know, I knew that story. And then they said maybe somebody killed the lamb and didn't apply the blood. And that would be like somebody that believed in their heads but not in their heart. And when they said that, <clears throat> God spoke to me for the first time. And he said, Peggy, that's you. And I, I had no doubt that it was God, and I had no doubt that it was true, but it was a whole shock to me because instead of be, being a Christian, I was all of a sudden on the other side of the fence. And I had to make a decision, or I had to do something if I was going to be a Christian. And I thought, I was 16. I've never known as much since then. <laughs> Downhill ever since that time. But I, I thought, well, I'll just look them over. I'll look over these Christians if I'm not one of them. And it didn't take me long to find something wrong with nearly everybody I knew. But I was going through a turmoil and a, and a struggle that nobody ever knew about mm -hmm. except me. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, <clears throat> I was wrestling with God. And then that summer I went to a Christian camp, first one I'd ever been to. 
and um, they gave an invitation at the fireside and said, if you want to receive Jesus, pick up a stick and put it on the fire. And I sat there and I thought, boy, I would feel really dumb if I did that. Everybody thinks I'm a Christian. And I, I struggled and struggled, but God was so speaking to me. I finally went out and put a stick on the fire. I don't know what I said. I don't know if I said anything. But sometime that night, Jesus became real to me. And I was, he was, I just felt like I could reach out and touch him. He was so real. And that was 80 years ago. And he's never left. So briefly describe for us perhaps what it was like you um, as a young mom. Um, you had five children in six years and one month. That's a, an interesting lifestyle. And you'd been a single missionary before that. And so can you describe for us a little bit about the big change and the turn in your life and, and <clears throat> where did you live and what was life like for you at that point? Well, Jim and I were out in Colorado again where I had been a missionary and he was um, pastor there of the little church where we where I had been where he grew up and uh, I had f I had three children they were little two of them were in diapers and we didn't have running water that's an experience <laughs> And then I, Paul had Paul and Larry had pulled a steamer off and had scalded the the skin off his back. He was in the hospital for ten ten days. We got him home and he had to stay <clears throat> in a crib because of infection, danger of infection. And so, the oldest one that I had was uh, kind of immobilized as far as help, and the other two were babies in diapers. And I walked out in the kitchen one morning and felt that, uh, that old familiar feeling. By this time, I knew what it was. And I was, my world just fell apart. I, with three children, I had still been able to teach, and I could still go places, and I knew four would stop me cold. And I didn't, I, I am not domestic, I am not... I don't, to me, housekeeping is like stringing beads with no knot on the end. And I just was so depressed. I wrestled with that and wrestled with that, and I, I really struggled. And finally the Lord said to me one day, he said, Peggy, you have given your life to me for full-time service, but you haven't given your life to me. And I thought, ooh. So I faced it, and I finally kind of gritted my teeth and said, okay, if all I ever do is change diapers and mop up milk, I'll do it for you. I don't think I was gracious about it at all. <laughs> but, um, but that changed my whole spirit. And by the time Rex was born, <clears throat> he was welcome. And then when two years later the Becky was born, she hardly made a ripple. Because once you're dead, you're dead. You might as well be dead for five as for one. Make it worth your while. <laughs> oh, I, I understand there was a key moment in your life when you felt like you really surrendered your kids to God. Can you share a little bit about what that was like and where that occurred? Well, truthfully, as soon as I got married, I began to think that, about children, and I said, Lord, I don't want to have any children that won't grow up and honor you. If you, if you let me have a baby and you look ahead and know that that baby will not honor you, I'd rather lose them as, as infants than let them grow up and and turn away. And then every time one got real sick, I had to evaluate that <laughs> when they were real children and not just fantasies. 
And God has been faithful, and all five of them came to know him. Wasn't there, a, I remember, <clears throat> recall a story about you bringing them forward at church? I did. Jim gave an invitation at at a Christmas service and said, what are you going to give to Jesus for his birthday? And I was sit sitting there in the service, and I thought, <laughs> I don't have anything. <laughs> so I gathered up all the children and took them forward. And then years later, when I was really, I, I, I heard one of them preach, I think it was, and I was so marveling. And God said, when you gave them, I took them. So how would you say you incorporated scripture and the truth of scripture in your life as you raised and disciplined your kids, especially in discipline? I don't know that I did it for discipline. I did. I, I had devotions with the kids before they went to bed every night. Mm -hmm. And I remember probably when Paul was two or three, uh, I kind of expected him to just sit up and listen. Two and three doesn't sit up and listen. But anyway, um, I was struggling with that. And one day the Lord said, Peggy, you've spent hours working on something to make the Bible interesting to other people and all you do is fuss at your own. So I, t <laughs> I got a little final graph about this big and, and some little figures and began to do it so that they would be interested and that helped us both. It helped the kids and helped me. And then every night we had a Bible story or a story, and, read, and when they got old enough to read the scripture, at Christmas, their first grade, they got a Bible for, of their own. And then from then on, they could read as we went around. And they had to have help, but they started then. And then as they got older, of course, it began to, they began to challenge and began to ask questions and we had a, had a good time. We had a good Bible discussion. Hard to get them to bed after that, but it was, uh, it was just a part of our lives. Mm. Always was. So as your kids began to um, express their own thoughts and feelings and maybe express even some uh, doubts or questions about faith in general, do you have any examples or times that you remember um, what that was like or how you responded to that? The one I remember particularly was our third son, Kendall. And he he's, was about 15 or 16. And he said, Mother, I got to talk to you. And I said, okay, what's, what's going on? He said, I'm just doubting everything. I said, wonderful. And he said, no kidding? I said, absolutely. God is real. And he's not afraid of your questions. Just keep your questions honest. And I have, I, he never then did share when he came to know the Lord. But it, but it eventually, I mean, a year, I don't know if it was that same year, but soon um, he began to show signs of real life. And he did come to know the Lord. But oh. it, I, I, and, and the kids would come home <clears throat> and ask me about what they learned at school, especially in the area of uh, evolution. Paul particularly would come home and and say what the, what he had been taught, and then I would uh, answer what the scripture said, and and I, I felt much better when I found out that when he got to school, he was using my answers for <laughs> for the school. But he didn't tell me that; somebody else told me that. <laughs> anyway, it, it was just good interchange. Mm -hmm. There was a time um, when I know that Paul was struggling and you had a, an ability to speak into his life as he was growing up. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. It, it, he, it was when he was pretty young. I, 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 don't, I don't remember how old he was, but I would say four or five, maybe six. He might have been six. He just got mean. He was hitting the other kids, and he just was so different from what he usually was. And so I went to the Lord and said, what's, what's going on? What should I do? And the Lord said, what do you want in a child? And so I 
began to evaluate, what do I want in a child? I want them to be honest. I want them to be reliable and responsible and have integrity. I went down a list and I thought, you know, I'm describing Paul. And then the Lord said, have you ever told him that? And you know, I never had. Because instead, well, Paul could look at clothes and they just disintegrated. It just, he could, a pair of shoes would just, in two months, they looked like he'd had them for two years. And he almost always had holes in the knees of his pants. It, it was, and they was not in style then. <laughs> and so I was always fussing at him about that. And not only that, but when, they, when anything happened, it was his fault. And if he wasn't there, he should have been. And the Lord revealed to me what I was, I was just trying to dump my responsibility on a little child. And so I called him aside and I talked to him and told him how much I appreciated him. Paul was a straight arrow. He just, he just had that quality about him. And I told him, how much I appreciated what he was like and what, how valuable it was. Anyway, I don't remember now what I said, but it helped us both. <laughs> and he quit beating up on the other kids. <laughs> so Peggy, how, how have you seen God at work in your life and the lives of others around you um, these last 10 years at Family Church? What have you observed? Well, it's been a real blessing. It's been, it's been a wonderful thing. I, I am so thrilled that God is reaching people. People are so needing the Lord, and I am so thankful. Every time they have a baptism, there are people that have come to know the Lord. And the people that I had a Bible study uh, had come to know the Lord and were excited about God. And, and um, I think at Life Group, they probably were glad when we left because... I tend to challenge people, uh, but it was a good time. It, we had a good fellowship and, mm -hmm. and got to know people mm -hmm. a little bit. And um, we've just been welcomed here and blessed, and it's exciting to see what God has done. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap up um, on this Mother's Day, I know there's moms out there that are in the thick of it. Uh, they're feeling discouraged or they're feeling overwhelmed. <laughs> there's mothers that have great support and families in the area, mothers that are single and alone. What kind of encouragement would you give them from your life to <laughs> theirs? Well, it reminds me when I had the five little kids there was a lady in the church who had five or six kids, but they were all high school and college. And she came to me one day and she said, Honey, enjoy this. This is the best years of your life. And I went home and I said, Jim, if this is the best years of my life, I'm going to shoot myself right now. <laughs> it was not. It was the toughest years of my life. And I see now what she meant. You know, you can look back and, and see... How, how very special that time was, mm -hmm. but it was a tough time. We were in Wisconsin where the weather was down to here and the snow was up to here. And um, we had a wood furnace and and the kids had to throw in wood. And I, if I went to the basement to put in some wood to get the house warm, I had to put the baby in a crib and take the two little ones with me and then the two older ones stayed, they could, they could function fairly well on their own on the first floor while I was in the basement. But it, it took some maneuvering even to do anything. And uh, laundry was, um, we had, well, we, we had the, the washing machine with the ringers and the tubs, but in Wisconsin, there was no basement to have them in, it had to be in the kitchen. And then one day Jim came home and said, we're having a deacon's meeting here tonight <laughs> on a Monday when I washed. And anyway, soon after that, we got an automatic washer. <laughs> so if you're a young mother with little kids, they do grow up. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't lose them first, then you don't want to lose them. 
and it is a precious time, but it's sometimes hard to realize that in the moment. Mm -hmm. I never tell a young mother, this is the best years of your life. Believe me, I never do. <laughs> uh, well, we appreciate all that you have meant to us, and you have been an incredible support, not just to Paul and myself, but to Family Church Ministry as well. And we appreciate your, your life lessons and the ability that you have to to speak those lessons clearly in a way that, that really impacts us. So thank you very much. Thank you, my dear. I love you. <laughs> I love you. Thank the Lord.